I have. I have 9.30 now, so I guess we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, hopefully some other folks will come and join us uh, shortly. But I appreciate you folks being here, and hopefully uh, uh, God is uh, pleased with our presence and as we come to study his word, to hear from him. So he will uh, illumine us a little from his word. So prayer-wise, I talked to Jackie. Sandra is not doing really well. She's... He, Neurological events, I guess, are happening almost on a daily basis now, and they're still struggling to get her in to see a neurologist. So he's asked the neurologist to move up the appointment for her, which is still almost 30 days away, I guess, is what he said. So who would please be praying for her? Uh, I talked to Mary this week, and she actually got a shot of some pain reliever to help her with uh, arthritis and stuff in her back, but. The surgery was supposed to have that was going to, I guess, be a one-time fix and hope fix it. Uh, that's been delayed again. So she's set back into March right now unless the, somebody else drops out and they can't, they can move her up. But So she went from last fall to January and now it's out to March. So I guess some of the offshoots of COVID and stuff where people are just, doctors can only handle what they can handle with the people they have, you know. But, that's what we have so far with it. So, anybody else have anything for prayer? People that we know of in our family here or elsewhere? What? Okay, we'll go. We have a praise actually too. Our daughter, our son and daughter-in-law from Louisiana were on their way to Florida to celebrate our granddaughter's birthday at Disney World this year and sort of a celebration of her completion of vet school. And they went first to New Orleans and tried to fly American, and the flight got canceled. <laughs> they went home about 11 o'clock at night, got up early the next morning and went to Baton Rouge, made it from Baton Rouge to Charlotte, and the flight got canceled from there on to Orlando. So they ended up having to rent a car, but they finally made it. <laughs> so it's called frustration and persistence, I guess, in going. So it's, uh, some things they have to go through. Mr. Tom, would you mind leading us in prayer, please, before we start? Yeah, Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have together here this morning to study and learn more of your word. And Father, we pray for those who are hindered from being with us through sickness or other reasons beyond their control, that you might remove that hindrance and that they might uh, be about their normal walks of life again. Father, we thank you for the gift of your Son who makes it possible for us to have the hope of eternal life if we have been found faithful and we finish here. Pray that you will be with the teacher this morning as he presents the lesson he's prepared. That he might remember the things that he's prepared for us and help us to remember and apply those in our lives. Go with us now for the rest of this hour. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, we start this week trying uh, to finish uh, as best we can the last four of the minor prophets in about eight weeks. Uh, so I'm going to have to discipline myself and control myself some on that to be able to do that. Uh, but we're going to start with Habakkuk today, probably take a couple weeks to do Habakkuk and then Haggai after that and Zechariah and Malachi. Uh, that will take us through the end of March and April. There will be a new teacher. I don't know if he's going to be Patrick or someone else, but there'll be a new class starting in April with a new instructor uh, for that. And uh, so we can look forward to that information coming out uh, as we move forward. That's a general lay of the land, if you will, of where we're headed. Habakkuk. I read an interesting, actually listening and stuff, some people went out and guy trying to figure out, uh, you know, what people would know about Habakkuk and get a general feel for it and all that. So he went and asked people some different things about what they were doing. And 
some teenagers told him that that sounded like it was a new computer game, war game, and stuff we could play, you know? One guy, interestingly enough, and all that comes back and says, that sounds like a disease of the lower back, you know? And a, a clerk and stuff actually came closest with him and all that kind of stuff, says, that sounds like a Jewish holiday, you know? Well, at least it's a Jewish name. It appears to be Jewish, at least. But it, several different of the Semitic languages of apparently have words for where it may come from, but the name actually means embrace, the one who embraces. As we go through the actual words and stuff that God shared with us written there, you might take that as saying this is somebody who's really embraced their relationship with God and are working at that relationship to try to make it the best it can be. And in that, he comes up with some questions. Anyone know anything that's different about Habakkuk and the other prophets? <clears throat> Habakkuk doesn't tell us anything, doesn't preach to us, if you will, the people. All the other prophets have gotten their oracles, their messages from God, and then they come out and they're speaking to the people about the, the situations, the evils in their countries. Habakkuk is chapters 1 and 2 is really a conversation between the prophet and God and then chapter 3 is a psalm of worship and actually a, a really good example of some Hebrew poetry and it's I mean you could go through psalms and look at it and it follows some of the same meter and all those others of, of the poetry of psalms and the wisdom literature of the Jews. There's a lot of question on Habakkuk, whether chapter 3 was actually written by the prophet Habakkuk. You know, people going through some of the textual variances and textual studies and stuff. Uh, some of what I read, hey, there's nothing out there that says we shouldn't count chapter 3 as coming from him. It's just so different. Everybody's, man, that, that probably didn't come. And the other big factor that people consider is that the Dead Sea Scrolls, when they were found, there were a couple different copies of Habakkuk found in Dead Sea Scrolls, and neither one of those have chapter 3 in it. So they, well, did Habakkuk really write that or not? Could just be that the Dead Sea Scrolls they have there didn't have chapter 3. But, so, there are some questions about the, how the book was written, who wrote what part of it, and all that given. But I think... The message is obviously from God to us to listen to. So something for us to consider and look at. Have you ever questioned what's going on in your life? Ask God why? I may have heard some of that before I had children and all that. But, you know, after I had children, it was striking without any education Pre, you know, without any coaching and all that kind, those two little boys start coming up and, why? Dad, why this? And depending on your answer, they go, oh, well, that wasn't good enough. It was, well, why that? You know? And that presented an interesting challenge, you know, to answer their questions, why? It's good we want to know, right? Do we feel comfortable asking that same question to God? in our relationship with Him. We, we feel that questioning Him is something that's a little outside of the allowed, you know? Or is it okay to say, God, what are you doing? You know? This doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Florence and I talked about that some this week, about different situations that we may have seen in our lives that really let you say, man, okay, God, what are you doing? Why this? You know, why that? You know, different things that you come upon in life that cause you consternation and say, okay, God, I thought I was really understanding what you wanted and how you wanted me to go about my life, but this really throws a, a kink in here saying, what's going on? You know? I mean, probably one of the bigger ones and all that. You, you, there's a verse out there that says, bring your children up, you know, and you know, you teach them God's ways and all that stuff, and man, when they grow older, you know, they'll just walk in that. Anybody have any questions with that sometime? 
We got friends down there in Louisiana. Uh, the wife is a nurse, one of Florence's better nursing friends. The other guy was a high school basketball coach and administrator. And we were, we were really close to them. And their oldest son was a basketball player. And he went away to a, put in quotes now, Christian college. I went to one of those too. And one of my words to his dad and all that is just because it's got Christian in the front of it, don't think everything's there is okay. You know? That's not true. You're blind if you think that's true. Well, their son got up there, got involved with some different people and all that, at 20 years of age, got drunk, got thrown out of a car and killed. That was devastating to his parents. I'm not sure they've recovered from that yet. He was the only son. They had two daughters. How do you explain that? When they, he, 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 Grew up going to Bible classes, going to church, all that stuff. Learning God's ways. Our son brought up, I mean, we, we did the Bible Bowl stuff. I mean, we went to summer conferences, church all the time and all that stuff going. He comes up, we were actually at a church conference and stuff again. When he calls me over one evening and all that stuff and sits me down, he says, my girlfriend's pregnant. I'm sort of like, you're joking. This is, you're, you're just trying to see what I'll do, you know, what my response will be, right? You're kidding me. Wasn't a joke, you know? Now, he was a little bit bothered by the fact that her dad was just irate. And I, well, I can't blame him. If that was me, if I was in his shoes, I'd probably be irate too, you know? What do you do when you think you brought your kids up right and then something like that happens? And that really baffled Florence and I. And then we found out within days of finding out of what our son had done, another family that was in our homeschool group, there he attended the same congregation we did. Their children did the same things we did, basically, for spiritual training. And their number two son ended up having impregnating a lady out of wedlock again within days and I don't know if there's something about it related to their soccer stuff or not but their son was a soccer guy just like our youngest son they had actually played together some both forwards both very good at what they did with it but both of them a spiritual background went out and did something that I know they were told wasn't right that sort of left mom and dad sitting there saying, man, what's going on here? What's this for? What would you do with that? After a while, would you just come out and say, God, this, man, you, you've told us all this stuff about walking with you. We're doing what we can, the best we understand to walk with you and honor you. And now this kind of thing? Some people would turn their back and say, I've had enough of this. You know, this is an interesting, uh, I consider it sort of a paraphrase with it, but it's called The Message. But the author of this provides an introduction. Living by faith is a bewildering venture. We rarely know what's coming next, and not many things turn out the way we anticipate. It's natural to assume that since I am God's chosen and beloved, I will get favorable treatment from the God who favors me, so extravagantly. It is not unreasonable to expect that from the time I, that I become his follower, I will be exempt from dead ends, muddy detours, and cruel treatment from the travelers I meet daily who are walking the other direction. That God followers do not get preferential treatment in life always seems to come as a surprise, but is also a surprise to find out that there are a few men and women within the Bible who show up alongside us at such moments. Do we sort of expect that just because I'm a God follower, everything's going to be smooth? I'm not going to have any bumps in the road because I claim to love God and I follow his steps and therefore everything's going to work out. Everything's going to be straight, you know? Is that a mindset we have? I think it is a lot with new converts especially. All right. Yeah. It, you know, it, it kind of catches them off guard and, and says, 
sets them back, and depending on how strong the support they've got, I think that's how we lose a lot of people quickly. Uh -huh. It's a good one. I think we, you know, we lost that at the garden. I mean, that was lost. You know, Adam and Eve had free will. <coughs> they chose. There were consequences. Before that, things were pretty good. I mean, if they, had, they just, everything was taken care of. They would have lived forever. There wasn't, you know, death and all of that. And they were fed and they had a place and they walked with God and that's how God set it up. And then they choose and there's consequences to choices. I mean, so from there on, we're told, um, you know, things are gonna be difficult. And uh, I think where I would lose faith, I, I don't expect things to be easy. But I expect God to help me through. And I think that if uh, you know, there's a peace that passes understanding, where the world flips out about certain things, with God, I should be able to get through those things. And if if He didn't, that would impact my faith. He, whenever I've gone to Him and been with Him, He's there. If I've ever gone there and he's not there, that would turn me upside down. Okay. He's looked for me and I haven't been there, but when I've looked for him, he's there. Ah, interesting variance there with it. Faithfulness. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. Anybody remember what that says? You may well have sung it before, huh? God is faithful to us every day. His faithfulness is new every day, every morning. It's just a characteristic of our Father. Our Father is faithful. Our Father is not going to abandon us. But at times, life circumstances put us in situations that are tough. Okay? And just like Patrick alluded, if you read the beginning, God had, man, everything seemed to be great in the garden, but when man decided to go our own way, when we decided to tell God we, we know better, we can make our own choices, he said, okay, but it's going to be tough. Now you've got to earn your stuff by the sweat of your, sweat of your brow. It's not going to just be given to you here. You've got to go get it, you know? And woman, it's, you're going to bear children, but it's, it's going to be a pain to do that, you know? So pain came in now. There's chapters all through Scripture about God disciplining us, right? <clears throat> Life can have its tough times, right? And some of those tough times are God telling us, I love you. But it's hard for us to get that mindset, right? <clears throat> I think that's one of the things I learned through some of the things we had. I mean, Florence actually got mad at me after our son uh, opened up about he actually he just got a call that night from his girlfriend to tell us that he to tell him that she was pregnant, but so he didn't waste any time telling us. That's a good thing. But we were that was basically the end of the conference, and we were going on to Michigan to visit somebody in Michigan. And I, that first day in Michigan, I didn't even leave the bedroom that we. Uh, I stayed in that bedroom all day with God. It's, what's going on with this stuff? What do I need to do about this? What is the situation of my response? I really wrestled with that situation. That it's God, I think, that gave me the change of heart and mindset in response to that situation to recognize that, hey, what my son did wasn't right, but my challenge now is to still love him and love that girl as well, you know, who's now my daughter-in-law, you know. And help them through this. As in their youth, they made a dumb decision, you know. But that doesn't mean we need to throw them out with the trash and leave it like it was. Everybody has a uh, predetermined path, and if we choose to follow it, if that's on us. You know, when you said you um, you always question God and you stay in your room, you're questioning God on why He's doing what He did to you in the first place. If we all know that we have a predetermined path and we understand that things are not going to be because Adam and Eve made that decision, you know, we can't control it. And you're trying you're still trying to control it by questioning God. You know, God's only he's the only one that has all power. You know, so questioning him is telling 
him that why why can't we control it? You know, so we're not in control of anything. So as long as we know that there's a, a, a determined path, we just lean on God and ask for forgiveness of whatever happened in your life. And it just I hate to say it, keep on moving on because God's going to be there no matter what. He's not going to leave your son. So questioning him and what he's doing, what has already been laid out for us, is kind of contradictory of what we're supposed to believe. He's there for us no matter what situation. I understand things are very tough sometimes, but questioning God and why he's doing it to you, that it's still trying to grasp that control. And that's not what this is all about. Loving him and caring for him and following his his, um, his gift to us each and every day, that's a blessing. So it, there are bumps in the road, absolutely. You know, and to sit there, I don't want to say waste your time you know, and, and be by yourself and asking him why. Isn't that kind of like contradicting what, what this is all about? That's part of the lessons we have to learn, though, right? right. And going through as to who's really ultimately in control and how things go. And be comfortable with the fact that God's got it, right? Not me. Right? I don't have to understand all the outcomes. I don't have to make all the decisions. But I have to be willing to trust the God to whom I have dedicated myself, right? I have to be willing to take Good God. was most upright. Fear God, love God. That, did everything well. He questioned a lot. Yep. He had a lot of questions. And sometimes he may have taken a little far and got kind of put him back in his place. But all that he did, he, he did not sin with his, with his lips. Yep. Right? He, it's, a, it's a tough path sometimes. Well, it's, I think that's the other big example of Job with it. It's okay to ask God as long as our heart is right, uh, that we are in submission and we're trying to wrestle with ourselves and our human nature, it's okay to ask. But you have to recognize that He is the sovereign God. And that's all lead in to say that's what Habakkuk is really about. As Habakkuk's wrestling with questions that are probably pretty common to us in our situation. I really think you know, you, you, uh, Habakkuk, man, that's back in the Old Testament days. What in the world's that got to do with 2022? You know, that's completely something else. You know, I think not. You know, where you go through, and some of it even coming down, you know, to what I said about uh, the new believers and stuff. I'm really convinced, and you know, I've been with another congregation where when a, a brand new believer, we all we immediately assigned a brother or sister to that person, depending on their gender, to be a mentor, if you will, and help them. Once you accept, I guess, my point of view and stuff and look at it, see, Satan's really not as worried about you when you're an unbeliever. He'd like to keep you on his side and keep you away from being a follower of Christ. So he does some things and, you know, works and all that stuff to try to help that happen. But once you say, I'm going to be a follower of Christ... Boy, the alarms go off, you know, attentions, antennas go up, and he's after you. You know, he'll be trying to do all kinds of stuff within the first few days, hours and days that you've confessed, I think, to try to make you doubt it, give you opportunities to change your mind. And there's, there's, in my opinion, an actual frontal attack on a new believer by the forces of the enemy because he hates it when people say they want to follow Christ. He doesn't want that to happen. And doubt can be one of those things, right? A very common thing that could be used by the enemy to attack. Habakkuk. This is the easy to read version. I take it just uh, some of the actual reading through can be difficult to go. But this is the message that was given to Habakkuk the prophet. That's all he says about himself. No location like some of the other prophets. No tie to different people that were in his background. Nothing. From the writing, uh, those who I read said that they believe he was probably a priest 
something in the Levitical area and stuff because he was used to the worship, what the worship would go like, especially chapter 3 uh, when it comes through. He says, boy, that just sounds like the songs that the Hebrews would use in their worship times. So they think that this guy was probably aligned with that, that he was in the religious structure of the Jews and called to be a prophet by God. And God gives him the direction. Notice he starts right out. Lord, I continue to ask for help. When will you listen to me? Ever felt that way through prayers? Kind of prayers that you say haven't been answered, you know? That's where he seems to be. I cried to you about the violence, but you did nothing. People are stealing things and hurting other people. People are arguing and fighting. Why do you make me look at these terrible things? The law is weak and not fair to people. The evil people win their fights against good people. So the law is no longer fair. You ever feel that way? Pretty realistic description from life, if you will, right? What about our world today? Do you think you're fairly treated as a follower of Christ? In today's situations? Take the definition of tolerance. What well, tolerance used to mean what? At least as I understood it. it meant that you and I might have a difference of opinion on some, a different view of something, right? And, and I accept that, okay, you have a different opinion, you know? I have my opinion, you have yours, but I tolerate it. I don't get ugly at you. I don't, you know, but I don't necessarily accept what you have either, okay? I've got my side, that's what I go with, and I understand that you have yours, and I, if you will, Agree to disagree. Is that what it is today? In our public domain? Same sex marriages stuff, LBGQTQ and all that stuff. Now it's gone on to different other things and all that. Tolerate has changed the meaning. Now, when they people talk about tolerate, they come in, you accept that alternate view. Huh? You say the alternate view is okay. And in fact, you're willing to get on board and support it and back the things they're doing. That's what the public definition of tolerate means now. I, I find as a walker, as a believer in Jesus, a follower of Jesus, I, I can't accept that definition of tolerate. You know? Can I work in an in a acceptable manner. I just get my job done at Harris Nuclear Station among people who have different points of view on different things. I think I can. Do I tolerate? No. I don't. In, the, in today's view of accept and then I'm going to support it? No. Sorry. There's been all kinds of things that have come over the last two years out there. Our vice president, in fact, has a daughter who is gay. She's a big pusher in Duke on all the gay stuff. She's encouraged all of us in management out there to jump on and support this and that. And I, I don't answer any of the emails. I don't use any of the materials. I just let it all... I say sorry. I, I can't accept that. I mean, to some degree it's made me question her as a site vice president, actually when she can accept that stuff within her own daughter, you know? But that's just out there. It's okay to have a belief in almost any God except Jesus Christ. You seen that? We're to tolerate all kinds of beliefs other people may have, okay? Be it Hindu, be it Muslim, be it, you know, whatever it may be. Unless you say, I follow Jesus. Don't bring that word into the conversation. They'll shut you down right then, right? Similar situation here going on. So we got questions to say, is violence done among people? 
Do people respect God's law among us? I guess I go back to the question to ask where Habakkuk is. Does that bother us at all? Does it bother us enough that our people in our world today are ugly to each other? That they have no respect for God's word and his morals at all? Where we can just go on living our own life and say, well, as long as they don't touch me, don't leave me, it doesn't matter, I'm okay. There's our heart throb to say, God, this just isn't right. Man, what do we got to do to change our world? Do we see really in, as I think Habakkuk sees here, people living like that, what destiny they have? The only destiny they have is hell. That's all that they have to look forward to. And I know there's an answer that's different than hell. I've got some descriptions in the scriptures of what hell's like. I have no desire to experience that at all. To have a heart that says, I want those people around me that are doing violence to God's word, to have no respect for him at all, does it burden my heart at all to say, God, I, I don't really want them to experience that either. Or just I go on and it doesn't bother me a lick. They got their own life. Let them make the decisions. I got my life. Is that what God called us to be? Or do you think God called us to care? Some we got a question, right? I think Habakkuk cared. His people, the Jews, were not doing what God called them to do. And he had a burden about that. It really weighed him down to say, God, why? Why is all this going on? The Lord answered in verse 5, Look at the other nations. Watch them and you will be amazed. I will do something in your lifetime that will amaze you. You will have to see it to believe it. You would not believe it if you were told about it. Could not might be true for us too. God's working. God's alive and well. And I, I know I've used that phrase several times with all the people's worries about the virus and all the other things going on in our world. Perhaps even now and all that stuff with the differences with China and Russia and us and all that stuff in the U.S. here. And all the tensions going on internationally. You know, an ISIS ruler just got sh killed and all that. Our son's about to be deployed, you know. Obviously, they won't tell us where that is, but, boy, we can sure make some guesses and stuff from what's going on in the world, you know. And he's, a, he, he's, he's flying in a jet crew and all that stuff. That it, its intent is to go wherever the trouble is, you know. It's not one that's just out there on the backside just waiting for support. The whole intent of that... That plane and the people who fly it and stuff is to go where the trouble is and get right in the middle of the mess. God's working. But sometimes what God's doing, he says, if I, even if I told you, you wouldn't believe it. You know? You ever read Isaiah 55? It's a beautiful passage. And wondering how we go. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. In my humanity, I can't begin to fully comprehend God. I can't comprehend all his ways and the methods he may choose to use, right? Neither can you. Would he be God if I could understand him completely? Don't think so, you know? It's on purpose. That I can't, I can't comp, com, completely comprehend all of who he is and all of what he's doing. What's my challenge? 
we'll come to that answer if you're coming. I will make the Babylonian people a strong nation. Those people are mean and powerful fighters. They will march across the earth. They will take houses and cities that don't belong to them. The Babylonian people will scare the other people. The Babylonian people will do what they want to do and go where they want to go. Their horses will be faster than leopards and meaner than wolves at sunset. Their horse soldiers will come from faraway places. They will attack their enemies quickly like a hungry eagle swooping down from the sky. The one thing they all want to do is fight. Their armies will march fast like the wind in the desert. And the Babylonian soldiers will make many, many prisoners, as many as the grains of the sand. The Babylonian soldiers will laugh at the kings of the other nations. Foreign rulers will be like jokes to them. The Babylonian soldiers will laugh at the cities with tall, strong walls. The soldiers will simply build dirt roads up to the top of the walls and easily defeat the cities. Then they will leave like the wind and go on to fight against other cities. The only thing these Babylonians will worship is their own strength. The Babylonians, the power, the power in, that they in the world and stuff before was Assyria. Assyria had the idea that they, were, they couldn't be conquered, right? Nineveh was just, you couldn't get into it. No way you can take us down until the Babylonians and the Persians did that. Okay? Babylonians took them over. And people thought the Assyrians were bad, but the Babylonians were even worse. And the last verse even comes up, their God was what? Huh? Their own strength. We're it. Man, our military might, our ability to go out and demolish other people, that was their whole, you know, and even talks about their part of their warfare and stuff to build earthen, you know, Bridges, if you will, things up against the, the walls of cities and get in. We'll get there. They would go to whatever they could. Assyria took down the northern kingdom of Israel. Judah was captured by what? By whom? In 586 B.C., who got Judah? The Babylonians. Okay, just like God said. Assyria was taken down before by the Babylonians, and the Babylonians, the nation that came in and actually took out Jerusalem, okay? and put them into slavery. Okay? He took them down. Habakkuk comes back and says in verse 12, Lord, you are Lord who lives forever. You are my holy God who never dies. Lord, you have created the Babylonian people to do what should be done. Our rock, you created them to punish the people of Judah. He recognizes that his people deserve punishment, right? We've not done what you wanted us to do, God. We deserve the punishment. Your eyes are too good to look at evil. You can't watch people doing wrong. So how can you watch those evil people win? How can you watch bad people defeating good people? You've made the people like fish in the sea. They're like little like sea animals without a leader. The enemy catches all of them with hooks and nets. The enemy catches them in his net and drags them in. The enemy is very happy with what he caught. His net helps him live like a rich man and enjoy the best food. So the enemy worships his net. He makes sacrifices and burns incense to honor his net. Will he continue to take his riches with his net? Will he, the Babylonian army, continue destroying people without showing mercy? It's wrestling. It's God. Your people have been wrong, but you're using these really wicked Babylonians to take them down. What's wrong? What? There's just something not right with this picture. You know? How can you use people that are even more wicked to take down your holy people? Is there anything that stops God from using whatever tool he needs to accomplish his purposes? God's told us outright, walking away from me, choosing wickedness instead of holiness will get you in trouble. You'll have to deal with my wrath if that's what you choose to do. But he never tells us exactly how. He can use whatever tools he wants, right, to accomplish his purpose. And in this case, he chooses to use Babylon against the people of Judah. Really wicked, wicked people. How can that happen, God? That doesn't make sense to me. 
That's what he's wrestling. But then he says in verse two, or chapter one, verse, chapter two, verse one, I will stand like a guard and watch. I will wait to see what the Lord will say to me. I will wait and learn how he answers my questions. Where does he end up? Sort of like Job, really, right? Waiting. I can't demand that God does things on my timetable, right? Second Peter chapter 3 tells us a thousand years are a day. A day is like a thousand years. God's got his own timetable. He'll do what he needs to do in his time, right? I don't wait very good sometimes. Florence would probably come out with more words to say, Doug hates waiting. <laughs> That's just not one of those things I do really well, you know? Can I learn to wait better? Oh, I could learn a whole lot about waiting, you know? Waiting on God. Don't rush out on your own. And I think that's more of why I spent a day wrestling with God, is waiting to say, God, what would be the right action? Both of my boys have come back, and it's not because of me, it's because of God in me, but our oldest boy wrecked a van in high school track. Very first day he had ever taken anybody home from track for stuff, and he was driving Florence's van that day. He rolled it complete, I mean, over and over called me at work and said that's where he was. They were up down, upside down in a ditch. And so I left work, went and took care of that situation. But both of the boys came back and after that situation and my youngest one and dealing with his girlfriend and stuff, man, you sure respond a lot different than I was expecting, you know? They were probably more expecting a little bit of anger and wrath and that kind of stuff, you know? That's a waiting on God that gave me a different response. But when I have frustrations, when I have questions about what's going on, I need to wait. Can I see what God's doing? Can I hear from God to say, God, Doug, here's what's happening. Here's where you sit in this whole picture. You know? Sometimes he may just tell me, you don't need to know right now. You need to trust. That puts us in a spot that a lot of us aren't necessarily comfortable with, right? Because of the word there that most of us as human beings wrestle with. What was that? A brother reminded us of before that, that questioning God sometimes is because of I want control. I want to be in charge. I've got this and I know what to do. God's put me in a few places sometimes say, <laughs> you think you know? Okay, handle that. You know? Yeah, I, I don't know what to do sometimes. Most of the time. Huh? He told my job as his father is to trust him to be in control. Trust him to lead. Your job is to follow me. We didn't get through. We got two in, chapters two and three to go, but that's where Habakkuk is about. So I challenge us as we go out this week. Don't be afraid to talk to God, to bring your questions to God if you have questions. Bring them up because he cares about your heart and your soul. He wants to help each one of us become closer to him. But ultimately, the answer is, I'm bigger than you are. You can't comprehend who I am. You can't comprehend my ways. Are you willing to trust me? I am God and I love you. I've told you I love you. And I, my righteousness, my goodness to you is new every morning. Are you willing to trust me to be God? Patrick, would you lead us in prayer and finish, please? Father, we're thankful for how you watch over us. We're thankful for the relationship that we have with you, Father. Uh, we pray that you would give us wisdom uh, when we're confused and help us, Father, to ask for it as you instructed us to do so that we might 
know how to move forward. Help us not to get ahead of you, Father. Um, and we thank you for uh, the lesson that we've had this morning. We pray that you would be with each of us and help us to um, be better for you. And we thank you for your son. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you.